training. I'm going to get us started here. Really glad you guys are here. Uh, hey, could we give a warm welcome? We've got a group from another BSM in San Antonio, Texas, from Baptist University of the Americas. So glad you guys are joining us today. They have a fall break, and they're in town working at Mission Arlington, and we're really glad that y'all would spend lunch with us for impact training. We're, um, if you're new to impact training, just so you know, the, the idea behind it is every week we do this training, and it's to help us get better at engaging our friends, our classmates, our neighbors in spiritual conversations, so we have a focus on doing evangelism better. Um, And so we're in the middle of a series right now called Secular Creeds and God's Word. And I'll explain that as we get going. But it's basically, I I guess I can go and tell you a little bit. So the idea is um, a creed is something that, uh, that as Christians, we have the Apostles' Creed, we have the Nicene Creed. So it's short statements of things that we consider sacred. And when the pandemic started about a year and a half ago, I started seeing this sign in my front, in my neighborhood, and it started with the phrase, we believe. And so in a sense, it was like a creed, different things that that our secular culture believes about human nature and about humanity. Um, And to some people, these are almost like sacred beliefs. And so we thought it would be an interesting series to go through and take some of these creeds that that people are, feel very strongly about in our culture and look at them in light of Scripture. And so last week we talked generally about sexuality, human sexuality and marriage. Uh, but this week we're going to look at the phrase, love is love, um, and the idea of what does the Scripture say about the issue of homosexuality. So fasten your seatbelts. It is not an uncontroversial issue that we're going to dive into. But let's pray, um, and then we'll jump right in. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather, to hear, uh, to, to attempt to seek your wisdom, your truth. Uh, God, I pray that everything I say today would be full of grace, full of love for all people. Um, but also, and I also pray, God, that it would be true to your word. I pray that we wouldn't go beyond what you say, but we'd be faithful to what you say. But more than anything, God, we know this world needs Jesus. This world needs a Savior. And so we pray we'd be better at showing your love and your truth to our friends who need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today the topic is love is love. We're going to examine that phrase. Uh, and, you know, love is love. We could, sort of, we could agree with that phrase depending on what it meant. But when secular culture uses the phrase, what they tend to mean is that same-sex relationships are the same as opposite-sex relationships. That same-sex marriage is the same as opposite-sex marriage. And so love is love tends to be what the meaning behind it is. Let's acknowledge from the start that homosexuality is one of the most volatile issues in the country right now. If you throw in transgenderism, for sure, that's a topic we'll take up in a couple of weeks. Uh, And so I want to be extremely sensitive and kind and tender in the way that we handle it because the church has made tremendous mistakes in addressing this issue. Through the especially through the last 50 years and through Christian history, we've made mistakes. Today also is not political in any way. Um, It is very personal because we're not talking about issues. We're talking about people we know and love and care about, and faces that you know personally, and probably even some of you in this room who find yourself in the situation of being same-sex attracted. And so we want you to know, like what I want you to know is that same-sex attracted people, gay people, are people. People are made in the image of God, loved by God, and nothing we say today uh, will in any way uh, threaten that sacred belief that we have. Uh, Another question that could be rumbling around in your mind is why this topic at an evangelism training. But you know that when you start engaging people in spiritual conversations, this issue comes up all the time. It comes up all the time. Does the church hate gay people? What does God think about homosexuality? Isn't Christianity homophobic? This issue comes up in spiritual conversations all the time. Um, And so I'm going to jump into material. I want you to know questions will be welcome throughout, but if if you've got like a bigger question, save it for the end. If it's like to clarify something I said, I didn't understand that, then please raise your hand. But if it's like a 
kind of taking us in a different direction, save those for the end. Some of you who are the UTAers know on Tuesday nights, we're in the middle of a sermon series on the image of God. And our three main points that we've learned about the image of God is that the image of God, it defines our purpose. It establishes human dignity. All people matter to God. All people are made in the image of God. And number three, the image of God governs our sexuality. And so when we think about homosexuality, all three of these play in to to this issue. So first, God determines my purpose. I don't get to wake up in the morning as a Christian and say, I'm going to do what I want and nobody, including God himself, can tell me who I am and what I want to do. Because we're made in God's image, it means we do, we, we are who he made us to be, and we want to live the lives he created us to live. We don't determine our purpose, he does. So for instance, 1 Corinthians 6, 20 um, says, as Christians, you are not your own. You were bought with a price, so honor God with your bodies. So the issue of what I do with my body is, actually God has a lot to say about it, and if I say Jesus is Lord, then I have to say to Jesus, what you say goes. Um, The fact that the image of God establishes our dignity, this is where the church has really dropped the ball way too many times. Gay people are people. All people are created in God's image and have value and dignity. So has the church caused harm in the way it's responded to people, to gay people? Absolutely. I'm a child of the 80s. And I watched in the 1980s as the AIDS epidemic ravished the gay communities in our country And the church said, you had it coming. And that was a horrible and loving response, but it was pretty common in the 80s. And so we need to, we heap shame, we heap alienation, and we need to repent as a church for what we did um, and, and the way we did it back then. But the third thing the image tells us is that the image of God governs our sexuality. It says that God made us male and female. So gender matters. It's part of God's good creation. It also says that he told them to be fruitful and multiply in Genesis 128, the next verse. So God's design for sexuality and gender is, is the idea of starting families, an opposite gender, complementing gender family that creates a unit that can bring new life into this world is part of God's design for what marriage is. And so the image of God tells us that God tells us our purpose. We all have dignity, but God also has something to say about our bodies. Um, At BSM, uh, I've been here a long time, 18 years, and what you need to know is I'm not talking about people in the abstract. I'm talking about people who I've known every single year in our ministry, people, many of whom love Jesus and do their very, very best to follow him. We've had same-sex attracted people every year. We've had same-sex attracted people on our leadership team, on our staff. Um, and so it's been fun watching. We'll know a few of those people will eventually walk away from Jesus whenever, they're, whenever his commands butt up against what they, how they want to live. But a great many people who we've seen have that experience come through here are now living their adult life faithful to God not acting on those impulses um, and living honorable lives before God. And so as, as Christians, we absolutely reject bullying. We reject homophobia. We say Jesus loves gay people, straight people, all people, and so do we. Um, we talked last week about in the Gospel of John, it says when Jesus came to earth, he came full of two things. What were they? Full of grace and full of truth. And when we respond to this issue, we have to be full of grace, but also full of truth. And so we want to be like Jesus in that regard. Um, I think the way I'm going to tackle the issue today is I'm going to assume that some of you, or maybe I'll just, we'll just for assumption's sake, let's just assume all of you aren't convinced that what the Bible says about this issue is true and I want to try to convince you that what it says is. So I'm just going to kind of, I'm going to have a posture of uh, not, not we're Christians against them. I'm, I'm going to try to have a posture of saying, I want to win you over to the historic and beautiful view of the church. Um, so we're also going to limit our discussion today for now to, to, to the church. What should the church say is acceptable 
for the members of the church. What should the church say is acceptable for Christians? Not public policy, not gay marriage, not laws. That's a longer discussion for another time. And so now we're going to talk about what should the, how should the church respond. So to jump in, let's, talk, let's define some terms just so we're on the same page. Um, homosexual, it, it's, it's, the word sort of defines itself, an individual who could be sexually or romantically attracted to someone of the same sex. Homo, same, sexual, um, someone who, who can, can be sexually or romantically attracted to the same sex. You can be opposite attra- sex attracted and same sex attracted, and this term would apply to you, or uniquely same sex attracted. Another term is just simply same-sex attracted. Sometimes we'll abbreviate that as SSA. There are a number of Christians who find themselves with homosexual desires, and they use SSA as kind of a shorthand for that. And so I'll use those terms interchangeably today. But it's just a matter-of-fact term for those who experience homosexuality, although a lot of people in culture reject the term SSA in favor of these words, gay, lesbian, bisexual, or queer. You've heard, you know those words. Um, and so those are, those are terms that essentially mean the same thing. Gay could mean same-sex attracted, often for men, but it could be men or women. Lesbian refers to women attracted to women. Bisexual, men or women attracted to both genders. Um, queer is sort of an umbrella term for people who just experience sexual desire differently than what's considered normal. So those are, those are the terms. What we'll say in a minute, though, is those terms tend to be used by people who aren't just describing their attractions, but they're describing their identity, their deepest personal identity. And I think when we want to engage people on the issue, that's an issue we want to to, to zero in on. Not the desires, but identifying as my primary identity as as one of these things. Um, Another definition, the affirming view this, we'll use that as shorthand for churches or Christians who believe that the church should affirm or even celebrate same-sex marriage unions. Y'all know that some of you probably, most of you probably aren't part of churches like this, but you know there are churches that have rainbow flags. There are churches that perform gay weddings, same-sex weddings. Um, and so we call those in general um, affirming churches, um, there are a number of mainline older denominations like the Episcopal Church, Presbyterian Church USA, Disciples of Christ that are affirming. There's some new denominations like Metropolitan Community Church that's affirming. And then there's a number of older denominations that are in the process right now of splitting into two over this issue. So those are affirming. And then the, we'll talk also about the historic view. The historic view, this is churches and Christians that hold that lifelong heterosexual marriage is the only legitimate outlet for human sexuality. So sex is good, it's beautiful, it's created by God, but the place for it is in marriage, and marriage is, by definition, a man-woman institution. That's the historic, the church. Um, Some people will call that view non-affirming. I don't like that language just because it's negative. Because we are, we do in fact affirm God's good design for marriage. Some people call it traditional. I don't really like traditional, just because it 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 sounds like we're stuck in tradition and we're just we're we're stuck in old ways. Um, and some people call it conservative. I don't like conservative because it has a political connotation. Um, and we talked we we talked on Tuesday night about how the Christian sexual ethic it's really not conservative or liberal. It's very countercultural in both camps. Um, and so what we'll, what we'll define the Christian view as today is just the historic view, the 2,000-year-old view. It's interesting to note that m- many people in culture, the affirming Christians say the church has to change or it's going to die. If the church doesn't change its view, it's going to become irrelevant and people, won't, people will just write it off. What's interesting is, in fact, the opposite is true. Affirming churches are withering and dying. And non-affirming churches are st- holding pretty strong in their, in their membership and in their vibrancy in our culture. But affirming churches are dying. And my, my theory is, I don't want to go too deep into this, is because most of them end up rejecting essential Christian truth. If you're, all, if you're saying the exact same thing that the culture is saying, then you're not actually, 
it, you don't actually matter in the culture anymore. If you can get the same thing from the news media or social media, then you're, you're the one that's irrelevant. And the, the historic church is saying something countercultural that matters. But affirming churches also tend to reject the exclusiveness of the gospel. Jesus is the only way. And they also tend to reject the idea of repentance, especially for any kind of sexual sin. God accepts everybody, stances, and he doesn't differentiate. But we know that because we're all sinners, we all have to say, Jesus, I turn from sin and I turn to you. And a lot of affirming churches tend to be uncomfortable with the idea of a gospel that involves repentance. So to move on to what's next, let's talk briefly about why this is a heated issue in the church. Um, and I think, or such a heated issue in culture. And the reason is because sexuality has become ultimate or primary identity for many people. We talked last week about the 1960s and the sexual revolution. Y'all remember that part? And how, how there was this, there was a historical movement that took about 150 years to come to fruition, but about 50 years ago in our culture, there was a revolution with this new generation, the baby boomers, and they said we need to throw out all the old norms of sexuality and marriage and gender, and we need to, we need to have a total revolution, a total overthrow of the norms. Um, and so things like legalized abortion, things like um, gay pride, things like, uh, I think we had pictures from Woodstock over there, nudity is God's creation, that's kind of a okay, but <laughs> statement. But if you trace the movement that led to the sexual revolution, here's what you'll find. 200 years ago, a French philosopher named Rousseau basically said to be truly human meant you had to express who you truly are within. And that idea has become pervasive in our culture. It's the theme of every Disney movie. But the old people are repressing me and I need to become who I was made to be. Rousseau said that, now it's just gospel. After Rousseau came Freud, and Freud said your sexuality is the most important part of who you are. And that's become a pretty big idea in our culture. The most important freedom is sexual freedom. Then finally, there was a German philosopher named Wilhelm Reich who talked about personal identity, and he said your sexuality is your identity. Christian identity isn't primary. Family identity isn't primary. Sexual identity isn't primary. And so whenever somebody says, like, comes out, and and we talk about gay pride, and people wear on their sleeves their sexual identity as their most important identity, and there's some reasons because people have been marginalized, there's some reasons they want to assert that, but also what they're doing is they're, they're sharing this philosophical movement. They don't even know that they bought into philosophy that says sexuality is the most important part of who you are, but they have. And so whenever something sacred gets challenged, we get very, very upset and angry. We, in, in religion, whenever somebody who's an insider threatens something sacred, we call them a heretic. And so if sexuality is sacred and you tell somebody, um, uh, and, and you tell somebody, I disagree with your sexuality, Uh, you end up getting phrases like, um, you deny my right to exist. Have you heard that language before? If you say, I'm I'm not sure I think that God approves of gay marriage, then people say, why do you deny my right to exist? Because they can't imagine an existence where sexuality isn't primary. I had a girl last week that we were having a conversation after the training, and she said, I have a gay friend And we talk about faith, but this topic always comes up, and I never know because she's not a Christian, and so I know she needs Christ. She doesn't need, like, a change in her morality, and we believe that. Sinners need Jesus, that we don't need to, like, straighten out all of our moral convictions first. And she said, but how do I, because she brings it up, how do I, like, address it but still make it about Jesus? And one of the ways when you have a conversation with somebody um, who's who feels this way, one of the good things is just to challenge the idea of identity. Um, We're saved by faith in Jesus, not by morality. Non-Christians need Jesus, not morality. But maybe a good statement would be something like, you know, what I found is that my ultimate identity comes from my relationship with God, with my creator. 
And so the first way I think of myself is as a Christian and a child of God and a creation of God. Um, and I don't want anybody to settle for less than that. And, and I don't want anybody to get their primary identity from their politics or their, or their, like, their money or, or not from their sexuality either. And so what would you think about pursue, investigating Jesus as the most precious thing and then letting the chips fall after that? Uh, let's keep going. Um, can you be gay and be a Christian? I won't camp out here very long. The answer is yes, depending on what you mean by that. Let's unpack a little bit about what people mean. If by gay somebody means I'm a person who's attracted to people of the same gender, can that person be a Christian? Absolutely. There have been saints all throughout church history with this same experience who were faithful, loyal, and, uh, and lived honorable lives before Jesus. Can I face temptation? I mean, y'all tell me, can you face different types of sexual temptation and still be a Christian? I hope so, because I do, and y'all do too. Can you be... Can a faithful, obedient Christian experience same-sex attraction? Absolutely. And I know countless. I know countless. In fact, I have friends and that, are, that are SSA. And if they're out, then I'm definitely out. Because they live lives that are far more honorable, far more holy, far more like zealous in the pursuit of the face of God than mine are. Um, so yes, but if you mean... Can, somebody be, can you be gay and be Christian if you mean my ultimate identity is my sexuality. I follow it before I follow Jesus. And I don't care what Jesus says. I'm going to do what I want. Just like politics can be family, money, influence. It can't be, can't, it can't be your God or your ultimate identity. If Jesus isn't Lord, you aren't a Christian. So... Um, I'd like to say more, but we're running short on time. Um, also, let's just acknowledge you guys, especially your generation, the social media pressure, the pressure in the classrooms you feel, the pressure with friends you feel, you have in, intense pressure to compromise on this issue. There are commands of Jesus that we have to hold in tension. Jesus said, love your neighbor. So we want to do that really, really well. He also said, love God with your lives, with, your, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So I don't want to compromise on truth, but I also don't want to be a meanie either. Um, I love the way Jesus responded in John chapter 8. Remember, they caught the, there's a woman caught in the act of adultery. And they bring her to Jesus, and they say, the law says we have to stone her. These religious leaders did. And Jesus has to, in that moment, decide, do I condemn the person who has sexual sin or to offer grace to the person who has sexual sin. And he has this incredible way of cutting right down, right through to the heart of the matter. And he says, okay, you're right. The law says she should be, that this is a sin. But whoever doesn't have sin, you can be the one to bring judgment. And it says the older, starting with the older, wiser people, they said, I've got sin. I can't throw the first stone. And the older left first, then the younger, zealous people left later. And Jesus gave her dignity. He acknowledged her worth. In the middle of, even in her, in her worst day, he, he elevated her. He gave her beautiful dignity. And he said, then, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. And so Jesus both gave her dignity, showed her love, but also called her to live a life that was holy and honorable to God. Jesus did both, and he did it so well. Um, you face intense pressure, but you also need to like, be honest with yourself. The pressure that you face is about five minutes old. The idea that marriage is anything other than the historic Christian view is only about 50 years old. 5,000 years of human history, there's been one definition of marriage and family, and only in the last 50 years has that been, view been challenged. And now you're told that unless you get in line, you're out of step with history, you're out of step with truth, you need to know that this is a, it doesn't make it right, but this view that the, the homosexual gay ideology, it's brand new. And you're actually standing in line with all the saints of Christian history and every even non-Christian culture that had, a, had this historic and traditional view. 
Um, the culture is also extremely hostile right now. Um, it's, you know, the church has a sexual ethic that rejects a lot of things, not just homosexuality, not just homosexual behavior. It rejects adultery, premarital sex, divorce, polygamy, spousal abuse, child abuse. But it's only on this issue that people in culture want to persecute and even prosecute people with our view. The talk I'm giving right now is illegal in at least six European countries. And there are people who wish it were illegal in our country. There are state governments where it would be illegal if we didn't have First Amendment rights in our country. So we just need to be aware that like the fact that you feel pressure, there really is pressure on this issue. Um, Christians through time have been maligned, even martyred for our views on sex and gender. Uh, John the Baptist maybe was the first martyr. You remember why John the Baptist was killed? Because he preached against sexual immorality of powerful people. And they cut off his head. Um, let's see. And, and last thing I'll say on this, there is kind of a false merit narrative that LGBT people are a persecuted minority in America right now. And that traditional Christians are the oppressors who are persecuting. And while it's absolutely true that the church has made many mistakes, errors, the church has bullied, the church has done, like, the church has made its mistakes. You can't tell me that right now, like, tell me which ideology has captured the media. Which ideology has captured Hollywood? Which ideology has captured the social media giants who control everything that scrolls in front of your eyes? Which ideology has captured university administrations, corporate, or corporate diversity offices? It's this ideology. So this isn't a persecuted. This is like what mainstream, powerful American culture, it's their ideology. We are not the oppressor. You're actually the minority if you hold this view. So a modest goal for the next couple minutes is, uh, we're not going to talk about public policy. I just want to make the assertion that within the church, the scriptures condemn same-sex activity among believers. Um, three arguments in favor of this historic view. We'll cover three quick arguments. Argument number one, anytime the Bible describes marriage, it is always a lifelong union of one man and one woman. Every time the Bible describes marriage, it has a biological sex component. Every time the Bible describes marriage, procreation is described, childbearing, bringing new life into the world is described as part of the intent of marriage. Same-sex unions can't do that. Anytime the Bible describes marriage, it's, it's, it's a gendered institution with procreation as part of its purpose. So that's, that's just a statement. We'll... We talked last week, um, I'll do that in a second. Let's look at a few of those scriptures. Genesis 1, 27, 28, first page of the Bible, God makes man in his own image, the image of God, he creates him, male and female, he created them, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over it. So from the beginning, God created mankind gendered, male and female, with a purpose of, of starting families and spreading the image of God all over the world. Genesis 2 is going to elaborate when God makes the first couple. He makes the man, he makes the woman from the rib. It's this beautiful picture of a partnership. They are, they are the same but different. She's from his side as a partner, not his head, not above him like feminism might say. Men are bad and women are good or chauvinism, men are good and women are bad. But as his side as a full partner, equal dignity and worth. Um, I love the picture that when God makes the first marriage, the man sings a song. It rhymes in the Hebrew. She's bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She's called woman because she was taken. Um, and then the writer of Genesis adds this kind of the consummation of the first marriage. That's why a man leaves his father and mother, is united with his wife, and they become one flesh. They're both naked. They felt no shame. God's good design, man and a woman, the first marriage established. One of the charges you're going to hear, though, is that that's Old Testament. What about the New Testament? Um, and some people say, well, Jesus never talked about homosexuality, so he approved of same-sex sexuality. Uh, I think it was last week, we, did we use the analogy about a, a store that had a sign that said cash only? If you, go to, if you go to a farmer's market and they get a sign that says cash only, 
they don't then have to have 25 rules under the sign that, it, that adds to it no credit cards, no traveler's checks, no personal checks, no debit cards, no cash app, no Venmo. Cash only means cash only. Well, if Jesus says this is marriage, if Jesus says this is marriage, he then doesn't have to come up with 65 things that aren't marriage because he's defined what its intended purpose is, what its design is. And what Jesus does is quote Genesis. So he quotes Genesis 2 in Matthew 19. He does the same thing in Mark chapter 10. So the Pharisees are quizzing him about marriage. And he said, haven't you read the Bible? Haven't you read? At the beginning, the Creator made them male and female. That's Genesis 1. And he said, and he quotes Genesis 2, For that reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. They're no longer two, but one flesh. And then Jesus doesn't just say that's marriage. He actually amplifies or strengthens the traditional view of marriage. And he, and he adds to it. He adds a commentary, what is joined together, what God's created, what God's formed, let no one separate. So Jesus says this is the standard, any departure from that standard. Adultery is a departure from that standard. Sex before marriage is a departure from that standard. Divorce is a departure. Same-sex sexuality is a departure. So Jesus said this is a standard, and that's the standard. Furthermore, you keep going, Song of Songs and Ephesians 5, all, very often when God talks about his love for his people, the metaphor he uses is the love of a husband for a wife, marital love. And, and so he, he intends marriage in a way to mirror his love for his people. And so when we twist marriage, we actually twist the gospel. Um, one of the things we discussed last week is sex is powerful but it has an intended purpose. So one analogy is a fire in a fireplace. If the fire is in the fireplace, it's beautiful, it gives warmth, it gives heat, you can cook food on it, but if the fire escapes from the fireplace, from its boundaries and confines, it can burn your house down, it can be very dangerous. Some of you have MacBook Pros, and y'all spent like an ungodly amount of money buying your $4,000 MacBook Pro, and it's a powerful computer, and it's lightweight, and it can do all this really cool stuff. But it usually, somewhere in the warranty, it says using this product in a way different than its intended purpose violates the warranty, right? So MacBook Pros are cool and they're powerful. Also, when I was a kid, make an analogy, I had a boomerang and boomerangs are cool because it's a stick, you can throw it and it comes back to you. So MacBook Pros are cool, boomerangs are cool, but if you use a MacBook Pro as a boomerang, it's going to violate the manufacturer's intended warranty, and it's, and it's going to cause heartache. And I make a joke about it, but God has a beautiful design for sexuality, and not just this departure, but any departure from it ends up wreaking heartache. Ends up wreaking heartache. So number one, when the Bible describes marriage, it's always a lifelong union of one man and one woman. Second, second reason... Anytime the Bible speaks of same-sex sexual activity, it clearly condemns it. The Bible mentions same-sex sexual activity five times. Um, and, and sometimes people in the affirming camp, they don't like these passages, and the claim will be that they don't apply today. They don't apply anymore. But whether or not they apply anymore, this statement is still true. The Bible mentions them five times, all five negatively. Um, and this point's true whether they're relevant or not anymore, but, and I think they are relevant. We'll talk about that in a sec. But let's talk through the five explicit mentions. Leviticus 18, 22, don't have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. It's detestable. Leviticus 20, 13, if a man has sexual relations with a man as one does a woman, they've both done what's detectable. Romans 1, 26 through 27 um, is describing this, this cycle of sin that gets worse and worse. And it says, because of this, God gave them, this is the, the Gentile world, He gave them over to sinful lusts. The women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. Men abandoned natural relations with men, inflamed with lust for one another. They committed chain acts with other men, received in sin themselves the penalty for error. In 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 10, we know that the law was not made for the righteous, but lawbreakers and rebels. So it's talking about sin in general. Um, the sinful, unholy, irreligious, those who kill their fathers, mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral. So it's giving this sort of umbrella list 
of major categories of sinfulness for those sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality. Now, your Bible might have a word other than homosexuality. In fact, it's probably a bad translation. The word literally should say men who have sex with men. That's the, that's the literal Greek rendering of the word. This is a bad translation because what the Scripture always, always, always condemns is action and never desire. So the Scripture doesn't condemn temptation, whether it's straight or same-sex attraction or temptation. The Scripture condemns acting on those desires in an ungodly way. And so a better translation would be men who, the, the literal word is men who bed men, bed with men. Um, slave traders, liars, perjurers, for whatever is contrary to sound doctrine. Um, last one, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? To be, don't be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers. It's all like the last passage. Men who have sex with men, that's actually an accurate translation. Nor thieves, nor greedy, junkers, slanders will inherit the kingdom of God. So the, the, the main point we're making here is that when the Bible speaks of same-sex activity, it always speaks negatively. Um, there's one issue. I can't remember if I put this as a bullet point on your paper. Um, I wish we had longer to get into some of the science. I've spent some time reading on the science, but this question, are people born gay or do they choose it? Do you have a strong opinion on that? One way or the other, are people born gay or do people choose, is it a chosen lifestyle? And I think the best research and all the interaction I've had with people with this experience is the answer is neither. Neither. Um, I've never met a same-sex attracted person who said, you know, about the time I was in puberty, I had a choice and I could decide to be go with men or go with women and I just made up my mind and I went that way. There's nobody who chose it. Any more than you chose to be straight, they didn't choose to be same-sex attracted. Um, so is, it a, is being born a choice or is it something you're born with? Um, I don't know anyone who said they chose it. The research suggests that the causes are complex, not purely nature, not purely nurture, just like every complex part of our psyche. Are we born introverted? Are we born extroverted? Or is it, our, is it our nature that makes us that way? Or is it our environment that makes us that way? Are we born, um, are we born uh, calm and high strung? Or does our environment make us that way? It's a complex mix of our nature and our experiences. Um, is being prideful, fearful, materialistic, lustful a choice? That's something I'm... I, I don't know if I was made that way by my experience or made that way because I got some genetic predisposition to it. All we know is it's complicated. Romans 8, however, does talk about the fact that we live in a fallen, broken world and that when sin breaks this world, it breaks everything. So it's not just gay people's desires who don't line up with God's good design. It's my desires that don't line up with God's good design. In fact, Romans 8 makes the point that all of creation isn't, is frustrated by sin. The creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of God, the one who subjected it, in hopes that creation would be liberated from its bondage to decay, brought into freedom. Um, so third reason, we need to get to this one, is third reason for the historic view, there's been a complete... 2,000-year consensus among Christians separated by time, geography, culture, and ethnicity on the first two points. Now, just because we've believed it's true in the past doesn't make it's true, mean that it's true now. But we, do, we should take the wisdom of the saints who've loved God and studied the Scriptures and poured over them for 2,000 years. We should take that seriously. And no Christian teacher in all of church history has looked at the scriptures and come up with another conclusion until 50 years ago. After the sexual revolution said the culture needs to normalize it, then a few churches started saying, well, I guess we better do it too. This is the historic view we're, we're talking about. We're not talking about the American Christian view. We're talking about the, this is the African Christian view. 
the Asian Christian view, the Latin American Christian view, it's a Catholic view, the Orthodox view, the Pentecostal view, the Baptist view, the black view, the brown view, the white view, the rich view, the poor view. People as churches is different. You know, there's like snake handling churches in Appalachia. Like, like it's some weird stuff, right? And then there's these like Orthodox churches and they wear these black robes and they have these beards and it's all these incredible formalities that are involved. And then you got Pentecostals with their hands raised and you got Presbyterians who wouldn't dare raise their hand. And you've got Africans who worship under a tree and you've got Asians who worship in house churches. And it's been that way for 2,000 years and they've all spoken with one voice on this issue until five minutes ago. So you don't need to feel threatened that starting five minutes ago, somebody said, we need to change 2,000 years of church teaching. We don't. So, um, and this is, oh, yeah, we got a second for this. It actually ends up being an interesting form of racism in the church today. Because what you have, I'll give you an example. The United Methodist Church, Methodist, um, it's a global denomination. So there are Methodists in Africa, Europe, and in the U.S., in Latin America. Um, so it's a global church, and they make decisions together. But a lot of the money and a lot of the power and prestige comes from, like, North American and American churches who have a lot of money. They control the institutions. Their global headquarters is here. And so what you have is a small, rich group of almost totally white people who think gay marriage should be part of the church. Then you've got a group that's much larger in number, but the African churches, the Asian churches, the European churches, which are full of immigrants that are brown and black-skinned people. And this small group of liberal people are telling the brown people, y'all need to trust us because we know what's better for you. And it's incredibly patronizing because basically the uh, affirming churches, it is a Western, North American European phenomenon, and the global church is not having this discussion. And so for us to say this is how Christianity has to change is us speaking from our position as people in the West saying this is what's better for everybody. This is what's better for y'all. This is what y'all need to do. So it's just created an interesting tension from people who are supposedly progressive in their politics. Um, Aren't there churches, kind of to wrap up, last big category, Aren't there churches that affirm same-sex sexuality? And the answer is yes, there are some of them. Uh, within walking distance of here, there are a couple of churches in that category that are, that are affirming churches. And they make their argument in one of two broad categories. And we'll kind of... So the first category is what you might call the new knowledge argument. This is kind of an umbrella category for this. Um, what they would argue is that in the Bible times... Same-sex, lifelong, loving, monogamous relationships didn't exist. The Bible describes what was common in that culture, which was people who had power, wealthy people, maybe slave owners, sexually abusing their slaves. And so a, a master might force a teenage slave to have sex with them, and that's what the Bible condemns. And the Bible doesn't know anything about what we have as loving mutual, equitable, same-sex relationships. Um, and so that's, that's the argument, is what the Bible condemns isn't what we think of today. The problem with that is two things. The first problem is the text of Scripture. Doesn't make that distinction, and in fact, language in many of the passages suggests equality. The Romans 1 text we just read suggests that it's not a man inflamed with lust for a subordinate, it's two men inflamed with lust for each other. It's two women inflamed with lust for each other, and it condemns that, not the, not the power imbalance. Um, so one reason is the actual text of Scripture. The other reason is because of archaeology. And whenever we look and ask the question, what did and didn't the Roman world know? The Roman world knew of mutual People who are same class, same social status, in same-sex relationships. And there's even evidence that in certain cities in the Roman Empire, they recognized, uh, particularly among women, those relationships as something like a marriage. And so we think it's a new concept, and so or the affirming view says a new concept, so we 
The Bible has nothing to say about it when in fact the Bible writers knew about it just like we do and condemned it. So that's a new knowledge argument. Um, They basically contend that if Jesus and Paul knew what we know, they would affirm what we affirm. We're smarter than Jesus and Paul, and if they knew what we knew, they would agree with us. Um, Most of the new knowledge proponents are not theologians or church historians. They tend to be advocates or activists. They tend to be bloggers. They tend to be like pastors, but not people who teach New Testament theology at a liberal seminary um, because most even affirming New Testament scholars reject this view. They say it just the evidence isn't there for it. Um, the second argument, then, is what you might call the antiquated morality argument. Um, William Loder, he's probably the preeminent New Testament scholar. He's an Australian scholar. Um, he's probably the best advocate of this p- position. He's, the, he's probably the number one affirming scholar. He rejects the new knowledge argument. He agrees that the Bible universally condemns same-sex sexuality, same-sex sexual relationships. He says that's what Jesus said. That's what the Old Testament said. The Bible upholds the male-female requirement for marriage. However, he just simply says, I disagree with the Bible. I disagree with Paul. I disagree with Jesus. He's somebody who studies the Bible but says, but I don't believe the Bible has any authority for how we should live our lives. So you can believe that, but I would contend that it, because Jesus says the Scripture is the Word of God and the Scripture, the New Testament, is literally the words of Jesus, we can't claim that Jesus is Lord and say we don't follow His Word. So the, new, the, the antiquated morality argument depends um, in, on essentially adopting the view that Jesus isn't Lord. Um, so, and that presents an issue with the gospel. So, I've got five more minutes. I think we've, we're making good pace here. Uh, real quickly, we've talked about Scripture. Is there any reason... This is a great conversation I had with my son this summer who goes to a super-duper liberal college um, and says so it's coming up all the time for him. He said, Dad, is there, is there any reason other than the Bible, other than the Bible for why we should oppose same-sex sexuality? Um, and the answer is, I think so. Like, you don't just have to say, I believe it because the Bible says so, even though the Bible does say so. Um, for most of Christian history, there's been this, this area of study we call natural law, which means God didn't just reveal himself in the scripture. He revealed himself in the created world. And so we can actually look at the created world and learn some important things about God that the scripture affirms. Like we can say, why is there the fact that there is a universe means there has to be someone or something that created the universe. So the fact that stuff exists implies there's a creator. And so natural law also tells us if we look honestly at human sexuality and we look honestly at how life flourishes most and best, then we would say that the historic view has merit. Even in the New Testament time, there were Roman and Greek philosophers. They were called the Stoics who opposed same-sex sexuality. Um, and they, they appealed. They said, if you look at nature, nature like... There's male and female, and that's how life flourishes in nature. And so we ought to think that there's at least something to that. Um, I won't, I've got a paragraph here I don't want to read. Um, but if you just look at the sociological data of the consequent, the unbelievably negative consequences in some cases for this lifestyle. It's heart-wrenching. There's reason to say that God's design leads p- to people's flourishing. Um, can people's orientation, a couple just random questions, can people's orientation change over time? Um, one thing that is a hot topic is the idea of a convert, of a orientation change. Without diving too deeply into it, there is a dark history of what people call conversion therapy, where, pe- where people who are same-sex attracted were told, if you have really hardcore psychotherapy, revulsion therapy, then you can change from being same-sex attracted to being straight. 
Um, sometimes that practice gets lumped in with Christianity when in fact that was actually a secular movement. It, it was actually part of McCarthyism in the 1950s. Um, and so we reject that kind of notion that, that, um, that some people use the language of pray away, pray the gay away. And it's actually a forged version of the prosperity gospel. Like if I just pray a prayer the exact right way, God will take all my problems away from me. Um, And that the scripture never promises that. In this life, you will see suffering. And so we reject that. There are countless same-sex attracted Christians committed to live by God's standards. um, And their desires never change. I've met some of them in my church. Um, One of the interesting things is in the debates, the voices of those people are utterly silenced. Like, like the the when somebody, in fact, I was reading today the account of somebody who's a same sex attracted Christian married to an opposite gender person, and she talked about the slander she's faced from the gay rights community. And so, um, but if you want to write a name down, Lisa Diamond. Lisa Diamond is a feminist, lesbian scholar. She's got a PhD from Cornell. Her book is called Sexual Fluidity. And what she does say is that actually most people, how they describe their sexual desires changes all throughout their lifetime. So there's some straight people who say they're married and they say, when I married my wife, she was the only woman I could imagine being with. And then they'd say, and then I went through a phase where I was watching dirty stuff on the internet I shouldn't have been watching. And then I'm like imagining all kinds of other women. And I had like a pretty monogamous orientation here. And then my mind is like going all these other wild places. And then I got my act together and I really only fantasize about my wife now. And so desire changes over time. Lisa Diamond actually followed it was something like 200 women who identified as lesbian. And over the course of 20 years, almost every one of them changed their, their sexual identity like 85% of them changed their sexual identity more, at least once over the course of 20 years. And so the idea that orientation is fixed and you can never change it may not fit with reality. Um, one, a good friend of mine, his name's Ricky. He leads a ministry for people who are Christian, same-sex attracted, but who want to honor God with their lives. And he leads support groups for people to just encourage each other to be strong in that endeavor. Ricky would say he's not attracted to women. That's his experience. But he started getting to know a woman about 35 years ago. They developed a friendship. The friendship turned into deep admiration. And all of a sudden, he's like, I'm not attracted to women, but I'm attracted to that woman. And Ricky had a 35-year beautiful marriage with that woman. And he would still say, I can find myself attracted to the same gender, but I can have a sexually fulfilled life, honorable to God, And not everybody can get where he got, but some people can. So the politics and legal stuff, uh, we're not going to get into it, but if you want to ask me about interesting stuff like gay marriage laws or the Colorado cake baker, that's a story with a lot of misconceptions. Um, But to wrap up, just the practical stuff, how do we interact with our gay friends? A couple tips. One, One is we treat our gay friends the exact same way we treat all of our friends. Share your life with them. Offer friendship to them. Have a real friendship. Trust them. Share your heart with them. Let them share their burdens with you. Number two, make Jesus, not sexuality, the most important issue. Non-Christians need Christ, not a moral lesson. We don't call people to be heterosexual. We call them to be holy. Uh, Don't seek conflict. So if you've got a friend who's got a different view, don't try to pick a fight. Don't seek conflict. But if somebody presses you, share the truth in love. We can't be people who cave on truth and just say, okay, I'll change my view because you're very persistent and aggressive. We can't be people who back down. Um, you will be called homophobic. You will be called bigoted unless you clearly reject Jesus' teaching. You will be called names unless you reject Jesus' teaching. So just prepare yourself for that. And don't take it personally. Um, there was a Babylon Bee headline. I, Babylon Bee's got, I don't like it anymore, but they used to be really funny. But the headline, 
The, bet, the headline back then was, quote, Christians should be more like Jesus, who loved everybody and was never divisive. <laughs> right? You know, a good, a good tip, feeling passionately about a topic doesn't make the view tr- true. Some of your friends are, you're tempted to be persuaded by them, not because they make good arguments, but because they get red in the face and they're angry about the way they've been treated by the church. They're angry about the, what they've read on social media. And so feeling passionately doesn't make it true. Arguing loudly doesn't make it true. Um, and if I'm honest, in the last 20 years, I've never seen Christians yelling at gay people. I know that's a perception. That's a trope. That's a meme. And maybe it still happens. I know there's the Westboro people. They do that. But there's like six of them. <laughs> but I've seen activists yelling at Christians hundreds and hundreds of times. So don't be intimidated into denying Jesus' teaching. And then lastly, what do we do with fellow believers that have this experience that are same-sex attracted? We share life with them. We share community with them. We worship with them. We support them and ask them to support us. They're people that we love. They're people that add value to our churches and, and to our ministries. We also need to acknowledge that denying yourself and picking up your cross affects our same-sex attracted brothers and sisters more profoundly or differently, hits differently than it hits us. So we need to be ready to walk with them through that struggle. And if that's you, God loves you. God's there for you.